Welcome to the medium is the massage. Uh, just a few things uh, about myself. Uh, right now my balance score is a 9.0, uh, which is great. Uh, and the reason why I say that is uh, the organization I'm with, Civic or Actions, uh, takes uh, life, work-life balance pretty seriously, and I'm very grateful for that. A um, little bit, uh, I was trained as an artist, um, which led me to binding a book for Pope John Paul II a while back. Um, started a nonprofit art center uh, that's helped uh, revitalize my community in Baltimore. Uh, I created the first uh, state online slide registry, artist slide registry, way back in the 90s. Um, I'm a musician, worked as a, I've been a church organist, and I'm currently a member of the Baltimore Mandolin Orchestra, Baltimore's other orchestra. And uh, I'm a Drupal engineer, evangelist, and a Drupal community organizer involved in my local community in Baltimore and, uh, and in uh, uh, Drupal for Gov, the nonprofit that uh, uh, has oversight over uh, GovCon coming up in July. Um, and I'm, a, I'm an as aspiring internet cultural critic, which today we're going to read from the medium is massage. So let me, are these on? There's probably a better way to do this. Let's go here. Nope. There we go. All right, so uh, the book, which was uh, the title was A Mistake at the Printer that Marshall McLuhan kind of went with in a very 1960s way. Uh, it was supposed to be the medium is the message, based on his essay, Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man, published in 1964. Uh, the book was published in 1967. Um, and shockingly enough, all these, uh, his essay, a lot of interviews on YouTube, I would suggest uh, taking a, a look at them, are still, still have a lot of resonance today. So, for instance, uh, he said, societies have always uh, been shaped more by the nature of media uh, by which we communicate than by the content of the communication. And this is really the thesis of uh, both his essay and book. And, um, and uh, we'll talk more about this as we go on. I think this thesis is still relevant, um, as are many of the things he's said, for instance, uh, like Easel painting the printed book added much to a new cult of individualism. The private fixed point of view uh, became possible and literacy conferred the public the power of detachment of non-involvement. And we're kind of, we're going to go from the 1960s to the 1860s, then we're going to go back to 2019 in this presentation. And you'll see a little bit uh, some of these innovations in literature and how they kind of follow McLuhan's theory. Um, electric technology fosters and encourages unification and involvement. And he could be speaking there about the web and the internet, but he's talking mostly about television here. Electrical information devices uh, for universal tyrann tyrannical womb-to-tomb surveillance are causing a very serious dilemma between our claim to privacy and a community, community's needs, need to know. Kind of surprising that someone would say that in 1964. So we're going to go back to the 1860s. We've got uh, four uh, American bohemians uh, Walt Whitman, uh, most influential American poet. We've got Artemis Ward, which was his uh, stage name. Uh, his, his real name is Charles Burr Brown. 
and he's the first stand-up comic, uh, predating Andy Kaufman by about 100 years. And his act was very much like Andy Kaufman. He got up on stage, kind of acted the buffoon. People would start to throw vegetables at him, and then he would let them in on a joke, right, in a very Andy Kaufman-esque way. Got Mark Twain, greatest American humorist, Ada Isaacs Mencken, writer, poet, and the highest earning actress of her time, and Frederick Douglass, um, abolitionist, orator, writer, and statesman. And why are we talking about these people? Because there were certain innovations that happened in the middle of the 19th century that propelled these people from the literary world to the stage to celebrity. So let's talk about them. The first is the steam-powered printing press, which the Baltimore Sun uh, was the first uh, newspaper to buy one of these in the United States uh, back in 18, uh, 1846. Um, and you know, American newspapers started cranking out um, uh, and more and more, more efficiently their, new, their product and some other innovation. There you go. This is what uh, Marsha McLuhan said about the printing press overnight. Printing created what we call nationalism, when in fact <coughs> was a public. So and you, and you can sort of see it, the 19th century, how um, you know, it's, not, it's not a coincidence that, coincidence that most revolutionaries have been newsmen, publisher, publishers, writers, uh, anyone from Mussolini to who, uh, you know, Karl, you know, to uh, uh, even currently uh, a lot of a lot of people coming out of publishing and and jostling things. So information is power. Uh, and then we had the postage stamp, which in the middle 19th century um, became cheaper. And uh, instead of charging by distance, they started charging by weight. And they brought the price down. And on top of that, they, they syndicated. Newspapers and publications were able to syndicate. So they could send uh, their articles across country, train, Pony Express, very cheaply. And so that um, the talent, Walt Whitman there, Frederick Douglass, uh, Ada Mencken, um, they would have their articles published in publications on the West Coast, and you know, whereas they might be on the East Coast. And so you had uh, this, this spread of ideas that the Pony Express, Telegraph, uh, Rotary, Cylinder, Printing Press, uh, all these things came together for information distribution. So what does that have to do with Marshall McLuhan? So let's talk about uh, Marshall McLuhan. Uh, he, he goes on about uh, cool and hot medium. And when it's a little bit confusing, um, just like this color chart where you have cool reds and hot blues. Um, but what he means by cool in the sense of jazz instead of 60s culture, cool culture, kind of um, uh, you know, leaving space, you know, quiet, um, inviting, um, inviting ideas, uh, hot, um, what he means by that is, is medium that is filled with information, that doesn't leave room for participation in the audience. So, um, for instance, he would talk about TV, how it creates a meditative state. Uh, the audience is participating in, and you know, he's talking about broadcast television. Um, so the, you know, back then you had two, three broadcast stations that you could um, watch, and that was a shared experience watching the nightly news every night. Like the whole the whole country was watching the same three stations, so it was a particip participatory exercise. Um, and as opposed to hot, which would be like going to a movie theater, like I did last night, see the new uh, Terry Gillum film, highly recommend it, um, where it's a really, you're in a darkened room, you're with other people, but it's a very private experience. Or like reading a book, 
where there's a lot of information, there's a lot of processing the information, there's not a lot of room to fill in gaps. So let's move on to 2019 and the web. Uh, you know, is the web a hot medium? Is it a cold medium, a uh, cool medium? Uh, and in, the, in its essence, no matter what your delivery, whether you're using uh, your front end's JavaScript, back end's Drupal, whatever it is, um, in the end, the web is words wrapped by HTML markup which hasn't changed too much since its uh, invention. Uh, initially, we just had basic text, some basic formatting, uh, hyperlinks, later on images, and later on video. So there's some aspects of mm -hmm. the web uh, that we could use to uh, uh, match it in with some of McLuhan's ideas about hot, cold media. So uh, discontinuity. So the act of reading a web page um, is a discontinuous process. Um, you might skip over pages. You might follow links. You're combining uh, multiple sites, multiple pages. You're getting snippets from each. It's a really uh, disjointed process reading a web page. Um, the pieces are shared by others, but never in the same way. Um, it's not like broadcast television, where you've got Ra Walter Cronkite um, you know, talking to millions of Americans, uh, passing on the same information. With the internet, we're all reading the internet, looking at the internet, uh, consuming it in, in very individualistic ways. Now, because of the uh, disjointedness, you get something that's called closure, where the individual is taking the parts and filling in the gaps. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later on in the presentation. Um, we also have segmentation in the internet. Uh, technology like specialization and characterization. Uh, digital media superpower is categorization. Um, you know, we all make websites and we're always, what's the first thing we do? We categorize content. We put things under menus, we organize things, we're categorizing things. It's something that uh, computers do well, and so the internet does it well as um, too. Um, but the web audience is, is also segmenting. So we're all having the ex individual experiences. There's good and bad here. Uh, on one hand, niche audiences can find a home Niche audiences can find information important to them. They can go to Ravelry.com and share uh, knitting patterns and, uh, and get advice from their community. Uh, you can go uh, learn about uh, very niche cultural things, uh, role-playing games, whatever, whatever interests you have, music. Um, so you know, we can split up into very uh, specialized audiences. Uh, which is unlike television. Uh, and we have a lot of participation in the medium of the internet. Uh, unlike television where viewers do not have much choice, we have a lot of choice, choices on the web. We are taking channel surfing to the extreme. Uh, how many times do you find yourself staring at your phone, flipping through Facebook, and really nothing's happening, you just, you know, a few minutes after that, you realize you're just blowing a lot of time, not consuming a lot of information. But we're, we're doing channel surfing on steroids all the time on the internet. So the, the web is the medium. Um, at the same time, sometimes uh, the medium can flip and and act uh, not cool, but in a hot way. And, and it can be filled with information. That information fills all the gaps. There's no closure. Um, so we can experience it in a very private, informative way sometimes, but most of the time, the web is a cool medium. 
So as people who make the web, um, are we using the medium to its fullest uh, ability? Um, what do we mean by the web, especially when the delivery is not only the browser anymore or a single type screen, we have um, uh, multiple devices, phones, and a lot of you are, are looking at them right now. Um, we're not completely engaged in what's happening around us, uh, which is interesting. We also have the closed web, and we have the uh, and we have the open web. And you know what what you know that experience can be a lot different if you're on Facebook, a closed web uh, site, or even Google or some of the other um, uh, sites out there that kind of cordon off their own piece of the internet, um, that experience can be quite a bit different than, than uh, uh, to different people. Um, how does it affect the way we communicate? You know, go to a restaurant, cafe, you got couples at the table and they're all looking, they're both looking at their phone, you know, and, or you have, you know, uh, hopefully you're not, you know, sometimes you're supplementing your, conf your conversation with information. So you can't remember a name, you can't remember a fact. It's supplementing the conversation. And that can be a positive thing, but it's definitely affects we, the way we communicate uh, individually and also as a collective. And um, we're going to look at a little bit at what changes are happening with the media. So this is something um, I've, I ask myself a lot of times about, you know, having, you know, creating websites, working with people, with content, with design, uh, with the back end, for, you know, building the whole thing. You know, in the end, you build this very sophisticated uh, internet publishing thingy, and in the end, someone just takes a document of Word and copies and pastes it, pastes in it, and it's just like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's just like you've you've spent a whole day making a beautiful cake, and someone just kind of like jumped in it, you know. And it's just not, you know. It's like, wait a minute, that's you know, or they post PDFs or something, uh, some other offensive practice amongst web professionals, right? Um, at the same time as uh, web creators, we do silly things as well. Um, we create websites with photo editing software instead of the tools that are out there. Um, and, you know, I think that's shifting a little bit. There's still a lot of people using Photoshop to design websites. And it might be a part of the tool set, but maybe it's not maybe it should be, it shouldn't be the primary uh, design tool. Um, the web adopts a lot of um, uh, print conventions, new, uh, often new technology, and this is something that McLuhan says, new te technology adopts the strategies of the old technology. So we lay out the web with newspaper columns, right? We, we wrap text around images. And images, how are those images really, are they, they're there, you know, a lot of times just for aesthetics. You know, we're doing graphic, we're doing print graphic design in HTML. And I think it's time to have an awareness of that so we can improve upon what we're doing. But sometimes we actually uh, create for the web and we write for the web. Um, we might only now be starting to actually do this. I think um, the web is still young. Uh, the smartphones are they're not quite a decade or just a decade old. We're still getting used to those. Um, wasn't too long ago that like our parents or grandparents wouldn't have been on an electronic device. Now everybody is, right? Our children are, our babies are. Um, we're still getting used to this, this new uh, medium. The tools are emerging, which is good. Um, 
and uh, publications have moved that have moved to the web, even though they were slow to adapt and there's, it's been a messy process, they're actually, some of them are the sites of innovation. So let's take a look. So this is an article. Got an article in the Washington Post. Um, you may or may not have seen this. It's called "Too Many Men." It talks about um, the gaps in the number of men and women in some countries due to uh, poli government policies or cultural uh, norms, and it does some very interesting things. There we go. You start to get some things happening there. Um, keep going. It's really beautifully done, this article. We start scrolling horizontally, which we rarely think of doing. It's got some illustrations that, that move and some illustrations that don't. Um, okay, yeah. So, you get the idea. It's uh, really beautifully laid out. I find that um, the, the portfolio sites like the Hans and stuff where you, they're supposed to be inspiring, I don't find them very inspiring. Um, so it's kind of hard to find little gems like this. Let's go back. Okay. So on uh, is out there, we do have some innovations happening. Um, some content-heavy sites are creating small innovations, trying to stand out. Um, for instance, here we have link previews in Wikipedia. Not a very, you, know, you wouldn't think Wikipedia is a innovative site, but they do. They, they, they have these innovations around the edges. Um, so we also have some Drupal modules that do this, just to tie it back to Drupal. We have external link preview and preview link. Um, if you're doing WordPress, there's some plugins that'll, that'll do this type of thing. Um, in media, Medium, uh, which I think does a great job making text readable, they have this thing called highlights, um, which can be a little confusing. There are, there are ways of the readers to interact with the author or interact with the text. Uh, and there, so you'll be reading a, a Medium article and you'll run across like some highlighted text and if you scroll over it, it'll, you'll get some options there. Uh, seeing somebody's comments or um, sharing the, uh, that part of the article uh, with social media. It took me a while to figure out exactly what they were. I think I misunderstood them the uh, first time I came across them. I, I thought the author was doing it. I didn't think, I didn't, I didn't, I just assumed that I couldn't read something in somebody's article. But it's a, it's a neat concept of, uh, of, of allowing the readers to interact with your writing. Uh, there's a WordPress plugin called Highlighter that will do this. Um, I wasn't able to find a, a Drupal uh, module, but I'm sure there are JavaScript libraries that allow you to do this too. So, how are we doing here? Um, this is a chart of 
uh, percentage of text on web pages. And you see that it rose, kept rising and rising to about 2006, where it starts to fall. That's uh, YouTube coming into the picture. So we've got um, you know, about, you know, we've, you know, we've got um, mostly text still, but we've got images gaining ground, we have video gaining ground. Um, there's the other article. Check out, I'm gonna skip over that because we're running out of time. Uh, here's a quote from it. This article uh, is a New York Times piece uh, about the internet. The internet was born in text because text was once the only format computers understood. Uh, then we gave it eyes and ears, smartphones appeared. And here's McLuhan, an information system dominated by pictures and sound prizes emotion over rationality. Um, you know, somebody saw it coming. <laughs> you know, 1964, 67. Um, uh, look, look at the look at his interviews. Um, you know, there's some strange dated things like everyone smoking cigarettes on television. But uh, but if, if you take every those things away, it's still pretty powerful stuff. Um, the WYSIWYG, the thing we all love to love and hate same time. Users love it. Um, I think web, uh, people who build websites uh, ha are ambivalent. Um, but for content creators, you know, it sort of starts and stops with the WYSIWYG. Um, I think that's changing. You know, here's Gutenberg. But people resist the Gutenberg add-on. They hate it. Or they're very divided. Uh, we've got Gutenberg for Drupal. It's pretty cool. Uh, and we got layout. So it'll be interesting to see what layouts does for the aesthetics, for the content creation process, for the actual content. And, and that's what I'm looking for is like how, you know, the tools that we use to create the content are going to dictate, you know, the, uh, certain attributes of the content. Um, and I, we need to be aware of that. So when we stick a WYSIWYG in a site, you know, we're inviting people to use the old paradigm. Um, another paradigm that's hard for us to contend with, even though we've been dealing with smartphones and, and, and uh, tablets for quite a while now, is the frame. Um, and you know, you know, we can swipe every way now, and we still go up and down. Uh, and that might be necessary for a while, but that will change at some point. We've got innovation versus convention. We have, we do have to think about the users and and not jarring them uh, into innovations. So we do have to balance that thing. You do, you know, for now, you know, probably most of the time we are going to be scrolling vertically for a while. We have to balance that convention, ease of use with innovation. Innovation is tricky because too much, you alienate your visitor, too little, and you lose attention. Ubiquity increases comfort. So we always hear in the Drupal world, oh, WordPress is easier to use, but is it easier to use because it's ubiquitous or because it's really easier to use? When I go into a WordPress site, I'm not as familiar. It, to me, it doesn't look like a usable interface or that more usable or, you know, there's, you know, it's familiar. That's what's making it usable. Um, Microsoft, Google, big tech companies understand the power of familiarity, so they use it to their advantage. You know, Microsoft sticks applications on people's de desktops. So suddenly, everybody loves Outlook, like way back when, right? And everybody's using Internet Explorer, even though we all knew it was horrible. And now Internet Explorer is going to be using a Chrome backend, so maybe there's hope. Um, but the big, the big corporations understand that, and that's how they, that's how they try to influence the market is by creating familiarity by 
saturating the market. Uh, where are we going? I would suggest everyone read this book. Um, it is a book about creating comics written as comics, and it's absolutely brilliant. And comics have a lot in common with the web uh, paradigm. Um, comics are sequential. Um, web pages are read sequentially. Um, comics use gutters and, and frames to create rhythm, to create meaning, to create associations. We do the same thing when we lay out a page. Um, comics have a lot of viewer participation. The viewer fills in the action in between the gutter. Um, what comics do better than what we do on the web is images, images and text trade off priority. It often things can be said just with images. Uh, text is, uh, the use of text is spare, sparse or economic. Um, there are even web comics, the comic, there are comics that are laid out for mobile devices. And so the layout changes for those particular comics. And you can purchase apps to browse those. Uh, here's a layout. It's a, it's a Japanese comic, so it's actually being read right to left. But you, you can see with very minimal uh, text, uh, there's quite a bit of efficiency, clarity in what the frames are saying. Um, the, the frames, the gutters, the images create a tension. They create a lot of drama in there. Another thing I look at is, you know, what are my kids looking at? And they would prefer to watch YouTube than stream programming, right? You know, stream programming, you know, it's kind of interesting. Stream, streaming services, they purchase the, the old broadcast television content. And, um, and in some ways, there hasn't been a lot of innovation behind streaming. You know, they, they would much prefer the DIY content on YouTube quite often. Um, they're not biased by that history of broadcast television. They've skipped that. They're, my kids are the I generation. They've had high-speed internet since the day they were born. Um, so they, they don't have that bias. Um, they get YouTube. Um, you know, they understand what Twitch is. Um, and they prefer lo-fi DIY video over professional productions. Another area I think we need to look more at is games. And this is a, uh, this is a, a gorgeous game um, design, again, uh, by an Asian designer. So a lot of innovations uh, happen in you know, comics. A lot of innovations were, were in Eastern cultures, Japan, Korea, and same thing with games. There's some the aesthetics kind of reminiscent in a way how Impressionism was, uh, was uh, influenced by uh, uh, Japanese art. And here, this game called Journey, it just is gorgeous ex experience. It's just the color, the light, the graphics, um, and I think we can we can learn a lot from things like that. Um, and you know, it'd be interesting to see what those things, where those things take us. Uh, here are some resources, um, further reading, uh, and I would love to have discussion, even if it looks like there's not a talk after this, which is great. Um, I just want to mention a few things. Baltimore Drupal Camp. I'm from Baltimore. It's September 27th. Uh, we have a really great camp, so if you're in the area, um, look us up. And uh, please don't forget uh, conference evaluations and uh, sprints not tomorrow, which is great. I'll leave it at that. So uh, any thoughts? It's nice to have a more participatory
experience. <laughs> I have a half baked thought. Um, so one of the things uh, I, um, one of the things I deal with, I work for research organization. One of the things I deal with quite a bit is actually uh, um, presenting uh, research. So data scientists, visualizations, and uh, one of the things that uh, that I, the, I experience is that a lot of our authors are not are, are authoring in code. Um, and I, I'd be interested to see how this kind of plays out where a lot of the, uh, where uh, they're not using WYSIWYG, they're, they're using code. And they're, they're, they're including text and, and video, but also experiences, applications. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, I can, I'm pretty sure I know at least somebody who worked on that Washington Post <laughs> app. And, uh, and that, you know, that wasn't necessary. That was done probably outside of their WYSIWYG. <laughs> Uh, yeah, to, to, yeah. to accomplish. So anyway, just an interesting thought that uh, it's just it, like the it fits YouTube into the medium is the message because the code is the. <laughs> yeah, I mean the comic book the, it's very specialized. There's a person who writes. There's a person who uh, sketches. There's an inker. Someone who draws the black line. There's someone who does the color. Um, that can be good. It can be bad. As with a lot, a lot of collaborative things, it's matter how you put those things together. Uh, YouTubers, you know the. They, you know, you'll see them develop, you know, first they're doing the editing themselves and then they have somebody else editing and suddenly it becomes more polished over time. It's always fun to go back and watch the first you video they posted and see how they progress because it is they definitely, you can't help but get better once you start doing stuff. Anybody else uh, comment before the next speaker gets here? No? All right. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fascinating. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, who do we have on next? All right, I'll get unplugged.